o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and start off with our business agenda for tonight. Uh, can I please have the call to order? Or the, sorry. Good Lord, you'd think this is my first rodeo. Um, are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none. Uh, 3.0, public comments. If anyone has any comments that they would uh, like to share tonight, please raise your hand. I'll give it a moment. Excellent. John, I have permitted you to talk. You just need to bring yourself from mute. Can you hear me okay? I can. Uh, I'd like to say <clears throat> thank you uh, to everyone in the administration and the uh, schools, teachers, administrators, and uh, everyone within the school board for what I would call from our perspective a safe and successful first week of school. Uh, I've had children. My, my children have, uh, by the way, my name is John Humpage and I live at 8 Williamsburg Lane uh, here in Scarborough. I've got a, a daughter in the high school, son in the middle school, and They've been in both the classroom and at home, and overall, it's been going really well. On the first day, there were a few minor glitches where my son didn't get a link to a particular class, but that was quickly resolved and hasn't been repeated. Logistically, the drop-off and the pickup seems to be going smooth. I've been asking my children every day how the classes are going, and, and they've been saying it's going well, and they feel safe in school and haven't been reporting any problems. The uh, everything that you are doing to try to get our children back to some semblance of a, a normal lifestyle is working. Uh, I've noticed a marked change in, in my children, their demeanor, kind of the, the children I'm used to seeing, you know, are, are coming back. Uh, everything from interacting with their friends and interacting with the teachers and being challenged at school. And even the, the little things like the dropping off uh, or the, the pickup of the meals, being able to order that ahead, those little things are, are helping. I also, from the athletic standpoint, <clears throat> uh, my daughter was crushed at first when she heard there wasn't a volleyball season, but the school went and bought a volleyball net and, and made the logistics to try to make something happen. And just a few days ago, they, they painted lines you know, out on the grass so they could have an actual real court. And so little things like that are making a difference. And I just want to say thank you. And they're appreciated. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Seeing none. Um, moving into 4.0 recognition. Chris Rowley, I have brought you in as a panelist. Um, if you wanted to bring yourself from you, just want to talk a little bit about the very incredible award that you have received. Um, Chris Rowley is one of our PE teachers. He's at Pleasant Hill. And he has been awarded one of 100 grants from the American Heart Association. What an incredible honor. Um, it's a rather large donation. Chris, if you wanted to pop from mute and maybe talk a little bit about what this is and how it came about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so after, you know, my students participated in the Kids Heart Challenge, which um, you might know it as Jump Rope for Heart. Uh, it's the same thing where they fundraise money for the American Heart Association. And my students were super motivated. Uh, I honestly couldn't even couldn't even say why or how they were. <laughs> they were so motivated, but they ended up raising uh, 60, over $6,500 for the American Heart Association. So, um, and that all kind of ended, or it was, I, I had sent in all their donations right around the time uh, we had closed schools and everything kind of shut down. We went into quarantine. So that was kind of put on pause, but I received an email from the American Heart Association about this grant and I was, like everyone else just kind of seeking for something to something to do and something to look forward to. So I went ahead since I, I had plenty of time, I went ahead and submitted uh, the application, just wrote, wrote a short essay and kind of talked about what I would want to do with the, with the grant. And um, in August, I, I accept, I, I got the notification that I was a winner. And over the summer, I also participated in like their virtual award ceremony 
uh, which wasn't, it wasn't much, but they like showed our school in a little like slideshow um, of one of the, one of the schools that won the grant. So uh, definitely super excited. And I've, through some thinking, I went ahead and decided instead of, instead of purchasing, I kind of wanted to go ahead and make it a bigger, a bigger project for myself and for my students and for uh, my school. And I'm going to do a little more fundraising and seeking out a little more uh, money to get a traverse climbing wall, which is one of the climbing walls that instead of going up for height with a belt and everything, you're kind of scaling and going across. Uh, and so that's, that's in the works right now. So I'm super excited about that. And I can't wait, hopefully by this year, well, this school year, we'll have it um, up in the, up in the gym at Pleasant Hill. Fantastic. That's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Well done. Um, just out of a point of order, I know that this was not in under new business, but do we need to motion to accept the grant from the American Asso Art Association? We should do that, yes. Okay. So motion to accept this incredible grant um, that Crest Rally has received. So moved. Second. Okay. And discussion? Declaration. Pretty um, excited for the kids and, and for you, and um, reflects so well on the, um, your investment to the, to the students. So thank you for that. I also could just congratulate him. Um, he's been with us for two years now out at Pleasant Hill, and I've had the good fortune to just pop in every so often and see the good work that he's doing as a phys ed teacher. And uh, I think he's very passionate about his work and I congratulate him for the good work that he's doing. Awesome. <clears throat> Any other comments? I hope you can hear me. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna ask if there are any other comments. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Great. Mrs. Jurgen? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes, and thank you so much. Good. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, um, 5.0 is an update on our school opening. So we can go to the next slide. I am so delighted and excited and pleased that we are open. As you know, we opened on September 8th, and it was an exciting time for all the students to begin to think about school, and, and hopefully they had a wonderful summer. Um, and we're just really excited that the learning can continue and that students can see their buddies and friends and see the teachers and, and really have a opportunity to come and get back to school and what school is all about. Um, particularly, you know, the learning is really important, but the social emotional component, particularly at this point in time, I think we need to pay attention to. Um, so charting the course, you know, good planning pays off. I just have to tell you that the people in this organization came together and very much worked to have a very cohesive group of people from the community, 90 members. When you think about 90 members and trying to almost build order and get consensus and to get a plan, it's an enormous task. And this happened over the summer and we had teachers, staff, parents, community members, medical experts, educators, administrators, and members of the ESEA. And they formed a committee. There's a school transition and reopening redesign we task force. And that has really been driving our work this fall. And at times I have to tell you that I was worried because it was so massive and so many people and would we ever come out with a plan? And it just clicked, it worked. And I think in the long run, we were just so smart to get all the experts together 
and to really form a plan that's driving our work. So I, I can't help but express my gratitude to those 90 team members. In addition to that, it's really the work of the people in the schools today, the teachers, the custodians, the cooks, the bus drivers, the administrators, and the list can go on. And those are the people who have taken that plan and they're making it work. And we so much appreciate the community feedback as well. You know, my discussions with my administrators that the parents are very excited and the students are eager to be back. So it is about an opportunity to, it takes a village. It can't just be one person or just administrators or one component of the community to make this work. We have really worked very hard with our transportation department. They have 23 students on the bus. That has been enormous. And you know, to be honest with you, we could not do that without the parents driving their students to school. So we appreciate that as well. Our facilities, again, a huge shout out for our custodians all summer, um, the maintenance crew, just making sure that we have the supplies and materials and the face masks and all that stuff together. It's really been great to see that it, it has worked well so far. School nutrition program, again, um, a lot of work going on there, and the good news is that we have free breakfast and lunch for all kids, and that goes until December 30th, 2020. The IT, you know, that's a pretty lean department from my observation, and particularly this year, the uh, pressures that they're faced with um, has been enormous. And so they have worked many, many hours over and beyond the call of duty, and the work continues to uh, be busy for them. And I just applaud them as well, because I know they know that there will be an end in sight when we won't get so many requests, but they have been uh, inundated with um, appropriate requests from staff to, to have the assistance to make sure that the computers are working well. So really, to the entire um, Scarborough school system community, uh, I thank you for the work that you've done. Um, we've cr created the conditions for a successful opening. Again, I think the good planning that went into that. The distance learning that is going on in each school has happened. It's going to get even better as we get better with the cameras and the technology. And we respected the valid concerns of individual families and staff. We know, certainly going into this, that there would be some bumps along the way. And we tried to listen and respond, and we'll continue to do that as well. And lastly, uh, we've identified appropriate curricular in both in-person and remote strategies, leveraging technology where age appropriate. And in the perfect world, if we get this down really well, we'll be able to make sure that our students are in the classroom and the students that are at home can see the same lesson, hear the same lesson, and be together as a classroom. So that, that's our hope, and, and again, uh, it's a work in progress, and I'm just fabulous. I just can't believe how the Open School has gone as well as it has, even though there's always going to be some little potholes along the way. So kudos to everybody, and I just really, I feel very passionate about that because I'll be honest with you, in August, I was worried. I, I just knew that there was such an enormous amount of work going into this, and, and would it come together, you know, because we've not done this before. But you have to believe in your people, and you have to believe in the plan and the work, and uh, I feel very proud at this point in time. Thank you. Um, before you move on, I think we had other really good news today. Oh, yeah. Great. So, as you know, I have to give the credit to Todd Sousa. He's really been working, um, particularly on the Coronas Relief Fund, for the opportunity to have an after-school daycare program. And with Kate Bolton and Diane and myself, we've collaborated 
we've collaborated with the town to see if there's a way to put a grant together so that the town can rent the um, House of Lights building over in Scarborough. And it's a response to the opportunity for students to have after school care. And we did receive the grant and we're very excited about that. And um, I think the next step really is to, to, to make sure that we get the place up and running and get the furniture in there and get the word out to the families and communities that, that this is gonna happen. And uh, it, it was a fast and quick opportunity. Um, it's not like we heard about this four months ago. So uh, I would, uh, again, congratulate um, Todd, particularly, I think, and his office staff really worked with us uh, to make this happen. I, I think he really steerheaded this. I know he had to uh, convince the council as well to support this work. And I think, from my perspective, I think this is going to not only be a great opportunity for our community, but I think there could be some opportunity to come out with some extra money at the end um, if it goes well. So I know Kate and Diane have been behind that scene as well, working on that. Um, and uh, it's been a good collaborative effort. And uh, we'll keep you posted as it continues. Fantastic. All right. Kate? Nick, I noticed that your hand is up. Do you want to ask a question for the first part? Oh, I just wanted to make a comment on Sandy's um, update about the school opening, if I could. So I assume that means I can, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just wanted to say really quickly that, that tonight's, the what we heard in public comments tonight was really refreshing. I know it's been a really stressful summer. Um, and in a lot of ways, this planning for 2020, 2021 began before school even got out in June. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment because we've, we've talked a lot about all the different people of our members of our community, our parents, um, our teachers, our educational professionals, our leaders, doctors, people that came together to work on this plan um, over the summer. And, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge kind of a little bit of the unsung heroes. And, and that is our leadership from across the district, because in a lot of ways, it would have been so much easier to sit down in a dark room for a week in June and come up with a plan on how to reopen school. But instead, you opened that process to this entire community. And we had triple digit number of people bringing in all these different opinions. And, and the part of this that's really amazing to me when I step back and think about it is that the leaders from around our district, the leaders at every level, took all that information and made it into a cohesive plan that was flexible, that had direction, but also was able to yield some, some, some give in, in this changing situation. And so uh, my mentor back in graduate school, all I'll say is this, he used to tell me, he said, you know a good educational leader by someone who tirelessly and selflessly cultivates change and transformation in others, but takes none of the credit. And so I just want to take a moment to recognize all the hard work that our leaders from the very top all the way through all of our schools, our lead teachers, that everybody took that information from the experts in our community and made this opening possible and made the feedback we received tonight possible. So I just want to say thank you because it's been a long road. And to, 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 to hear that after the first couple of weeks of school was really rewarding as a board member. And I hope you see it reward, as rewarding too. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Okay. Hi, I'm a little hesitant to get uh, into this mic. Is it is it on? I don't think so. Um, I'm just going to ask a quick question for the folks that are remote. If you were able to hear Kate when she was just talking. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So I'm coming across, and Leanne's coming across too, which is a a great triumph, right? This is like a whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you guys out there, let us know if we're, if we're fading in and out or anything. Um, so uh, I was asked to um, come up with a, a little bit of a follow-up to last meeting's presentation on the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, I think if, if you all looked back at the slide deck that time, I was just outlining basically what the funds were and where they came from and the fact that we had applied for them 
and what the different categories of spending, allowable spending were in the fund. So tonight, at the risk of putting 50 new slides out and uh, driving you all crazy, uh, I do have a little bit of a recap um, on the first slide of where the funds came from. And I have a little bit of new information there, as, as Sandy just mentioned, um, between the last time we spoke and this evening, uh, some new funds were released for day programming. Uh, you heard about that at the last meeting with Todd Souza's presentation. We applied for it uh, and we were approved today uh, via an email. It's an informal approval. We'll get the real grant notice um, coming up, but uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, frankly, Todd and I were, um, after our conversation with DOE, where we were um, thinking that we probably weren't going to get this money uh, because of some of the questions that they asked, uh, but they were very thoughtful and careful with us and they really wanted to understand our plans and you know how we were trying to make this work for our community. And the end result is uh, that they are helping to support us. So that's really exciting. Um, so thanks, Diane. Um, so I've linked into this slideshow at the top there where it says CRF K-12 grant. Um, I've linked in a, a much more extensive document, again, trying not to overburden you with a million slides and a million details, but I do know that people are really interested in where $2 million is going, right? And this is talking in this case about the K-12 grant, which is the largest one. Oh, and I, I should take one step back and say that the adult ed grant was also approved. You saw that on the last slide, it's uh, $8,500. And we've got a great plan for that, um, which involves technology. Um, we're going pretty much 100% for technology equipment with those grant funds because our adult education program at the moment is uh, pretty much remote. Um, the only folks that are doing hands-on learning in adult education are folks who are doing CNA um, and medical clinicals. Um, but apart from that, we've got a lot of learners out there who still need our help with workforce programming, with literacy, um, ELL, uh, English language learners programs. And so what we're purposing to do with that money is to buy devices that we can now loan out to folks. So if they don't have their own laptop, they can still participate in a class. Uh, so that's pretty much the nature of that, uh, where those grant funds are gonna be going. Uh, once this slide deck is posted, I think people uh, from the audience will be able to click in on the link, uh, but I'll just run down through the various categories. And uh, Sarah just asked me a pointed question, which was, what's the total? Which <laughs> I had to go back and look up because I had everything in bits and pieces. Um, so far, we were given a grant of $2.1 million. So far, as of right now, we've spent or committed 1.25 million of that. So we're about a little over the halfway mark in spending. Remember that these grant, uh, grant funds were designed to help school districts reopen school safely. So, um, Sandy mentioned a really short timeline on the daycare grant. Really short timeline on this grant as well. It was on July 17th that the state said, hey, you got $2 million and you have to spend it right now. So let us know what you wanna do. And business managers across the state went, huh, we're not really used to this kind of wild behavior with money. We're not sure we can do this, and, and yet we did. And so we identified all those categories that you saw the last time. And so now I'm gonna run through those really quickly and just let you know where we're at with each one. And if you click into the link, um, a handful of, of handouts have gone out here, but if you click into the link, you can see much more specifically um, some bullet points under each section about where exactly that money is going. So I'll start with transportation. Um, we put in a grant for passenger vans. Uh, and uh, you'll see when you look at the, at the LinkedIn document that we talk about why we're doing that in each category. Well, what's the purpose? What is it gonna help us do? In this case, passenger vans are gonna give us a lot of flexibility in terms of um, social distancing, putting uh, small groups of children on one vehicle it also helps us out that in that a passenger van is just a Dodge Caravan like mom and dad drive and it doesn't require a CDL license or bus driver's license. 
So again, we have more flexibility in who can drive those vehicles. Uh, so far, we have found, I say we, I shouldn't take credit at all. It's Ed Alden who uh, runs the, uh, the vehicle maintenance program over at Public Works, who is my best friend. And he has been sourcing used, lightly used Dodge Caravans. So far, we've bought three of them, picked up two and outfitted them. And we've got one that's coming in uh, this week. And uh, depending on how our budget works, we're going to try to get either two more or um, maybe one more, depending on the prices, but the prices have been really good. So that's a simple one. Facilities modifications. Uh, the, the next two categories, facilities mod modifications and then material and supplies kind of cross over each other a little bit. But modifications is more for... Um, larger scale, more expensive changes to your facilities to allow certain things to happen. So you can see in my little bullet points there, uh, we focused on the health clinics um, and you've heard about how there now needs to be a respiratory clinic and um, the regular clinic for students who have ordinary medical needs. Um, HVAC consulting, uh, we brought a firm in that we use for air quality control and guidance to make sure that we were doing everything right in that area. Outdoor break areas. I don't know if anybody's seen the really cool tents that are around. Uh, we've got tents deployed out there. It actually looks like we're having a lot of weddings, which is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's age appropriate, but um, they're really beautiful tents and I was down at the middle school this morning and the kids were out there taking a mass break and they're hanging out in the tent. It's, it's just really nice. Um, moving and storage of furnishings. So we had a really exciting weekend where we took, it was basically like we took everything out of one building and moved it to the next. Um, kind, of, kind of crazy stuff, but we took a lot of desks from Wentworth School, we spread them out. So their rooms were, were um, emptier high school as well. Uh, and then we took those desks down to the K2s and we took the tables out of the K2s because kids are used to clustering around, um, you know, four or five kids to a table. And so now we have individual student desks so they can space them out better. Uh, so we did moving and storage, packed up a bunch of stuff, packed up what I call the fluffy bunnies at K2 because you can't sanitize a fluffy bunny. So, you know, beanbag chairs, soft chairs, area rugs, that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, the other piece was reworking some of the traffic flow, which you've heard a lot about in terms of um, vehicles coming in and out, buses going in different directions, opening different doors, putting card uh, readers on different doors so that people can make different uh, pathways into the buildings. All right, that's plenty about that. Material and supplies, that's my favorite category. Um, I am now the uh, PPE princess. Diane is the PPE queen. <laughs> PPE stands for personal protective equipment, if you are not in the royal family yet. Um, and so we've been spending an awful lot of time taking masks from one place and putting them into other places and building little bags and shields and gloves and gowns. And oh my goodness, it's so exciting. I never knew I would be doing that. Um, plexiglass dividers. So these dividers um, are the tabletop ones that look kind of like what you guys have right here. So we've had two different things going on. One is the Respara piece that you're gonna hear about later tonight, where they provided uh, the plexiglass barriers that are going in front of the public areas. So when you go into school offices or into the libraries where there's a lot of commerce going on, um, they provided those. But we also wanted to have them for the students who are sitting at a table together and we could divide a table in the cafeteria or we could um, divide a space between a teacher and students so the teacher could be at their desk and still communicate with a student but have a barrier there. Sanitizing equipment, a lot of drama around whether we could use the electrostatic sprayers but we purchased a lot of those and they're really cool because they uh, lay down a very, very fine mist of sanitizing uh, solution, which is non-toxic, but it doesn't require you to walk around and buff, uh, buff every surface with a cloth. You can lay that spray down and uh, you can consider a large area to have been effectively sanitized. 
I say there's drama around that because we had a uh, little trouble with the state telling us that we couldn't use that equipment after every school district in the state purchased them because you have to have a pesticide applicator's license to do so, even though we weren't using pesticide. Um, very convoluted statutory requirement, um, which has since been ironed out. And um, you know, thanks to the good writing of Todd Jepson, uh, who has created some very eloquent and well-written pleas to state statutory uh, regu regulatory commissions, um, he and his colleagues have ironed that out. And so now with a certain amount of training, which we obviously want, we're allowed to use that equipment. Signage means things like those little floor dots and arrows and go this way, go that way and tape and decals and signs on the wall that say, wash your hands. All of that stuff is everywhere and costs money. And storage containers for student belongings, um, that's been kind of a neat thing because we're, we're trying to be really careful about intermingling stuff uh, that belongs to kids and sharing stuff that belongs to kids. So we've come up, uh, teachers have come up with a lot of innovative ideas of, you know, how to have your own pencil case, how to have your own little Sterilite box that has all of your equipment that you need during the school day. Uh, particularly at K-5, a lot of manipulative stuff going on in the classroom and not so much in the way of, of carry-alls. Um, the, the older kids tend to have their own backpack and they tend to carry their own stuff around more. Um, so a lot of money has gone into that and we've nickeled our dime and dimed our way to $164,000 so far um, and lots of bills yet to pay. Nutrition services. We've purchased software for remote ordering, which is working out really well so far. Um, and portable food service is sort of a catch-all phrase. Um, what that means is warming stations that are on, on wheels and cooling stations that are on wheels. Packaging that will allow our school nutrition department to be able to take a meal from one place to another and deliver it into a classroom or deliver it into the gym or deliver it into wherever the students are working, excuse me, are, are eating. And also prep it and prepare it to take home. Because I think you heard earlier that a student who has a regular hybrid schedule is gonna be in school two days and at home three days. So we can still provide a family with meals for those three days when the child is at home. But that means we have to pack it to take home. We're not standing at the big tray and scooping out the mac and cheese right now. Additional staff hours. This is where we put the biggest chunk of our budget um, for the, the K-12 grant. And um, what we've spent an, or allocated to date is uh, you'll see in the detail, it's really about um, some of the supplemental subs and extra folks that we've brought into the district to help us cover in the classroom in this new environment where some of our teachers are working remotely and some of our students are working remotely. And as I said, there's more detail in the, uh, in the LinkedIn document, but right now we have 14 uh, supplemental substitutes and their job is to be in school on campus and co-teach with a teacher who for their own reasons has to work from home and these are ADA accommodations in most cases and you know of course the COVID environment I could write you a whole other story about that uh, that part of my life um, the HR impacts of the of the COVID pandemic environment uh, but in this case, we've, we've placed a lot of extra time, uh, money for time, so that we can have enough staff to come on board and help us out uh, to keep things moving forward, to take care of kids who are more spread out, to take care of kids who are doing activities in a different way. Um, we've only committed uh, about a third of the money so far, and we may actually end up moving some of this money to technology. We're still balancing that in our minds. Um, as we're developing... Um, our understanding of what we actually need to run things on campus. Um, I'll say two things about that. One is that our administrators are amazing and they make something out of nothing every day. Uh, so they've been doing a lot of that to figure out how to make this all work. And, uh, and then the other thing is just the, the really short uh, span of time between when we got the money and when we had to think about how we were going to use it. So I, I know for a fact that some money is probably gonna get shifted to 
technology only because we're coming up to the top of our technology budget. And there were some things that we didn't have the time to do before school started that we were planning to spend money on in terms of training hours. Professional development. Again, staff having the opportunity to learn new things has to be COVID related. It's not just, you know, our normal curriculum meetings or our, our normal learning, um, adult learning that we're doing. So, so far we've spent some money on a, a really amazing workbook called Distance Learning. Uh, that's just like a super, super resource for folks who are trying to learn effective teaching methods for not being in the same room with their students. And we've also spent some time on staff professional development, staff getting groups getting together and working on curriculum. So there's some payroll time in there and there will be some more of that as well. And technology. So remote services and software are things like uh, Zoom and ProAV setting up this room for us so that we can actually have these great conversations uh, all together, not together. Um, but all the remote services, Wi-Fi, um, hotspots, and some things like that. Not a huge amount going into that. Most of the, most of the money that we're spending is going into uh, the live streaming equipment and the staff and student devices. So we've got extra devices for supplemental staff that we weren't expecting to have. Um, remembering that K2 Chromebooks or K5 Chromebooks, even though they were um, issued on a one-to-one -one basis, they weren't issued originally to be taken home. Uh, the K2s in Wentworth School, they stayed in carts at school. Um, so now we have to think about things like bags and chargers and earbuds and things for those children who weren't necessarily gonna use those devices. Um, even though they had a device available to them, they weren't gonna use it in the take-home way. Um, the live streaming equipment, we've heard a lot about that uh, from Dawn and from others. And, you know, we've had a little bit of a frustration that the, the shipping times have been so long. But it turns out that the entire world wants the same things we want right now. I don't know if you've all been ordering from Amazon, but suddenly Amazon is not next day anymore. <laughs> and that's, that's extremely true of technology when it comes to student type devices um, or school related devices. Um, the uh, supply chain is a little twisted right at the moment, but it's all ordered and it's all coming. Um, so in this category, we've actually spent pretty much all of our money. And so again, we've got some more ideas of things that we can do to be supportive to our teachers and to provide um, the best possible remote learning opportunities for our kids. So again, we may do a little shifting um, to take from the staff piece into the technology piece. Uh, so the next steps, we need to let DOE know on September 30, which as you may notice is very close, um, our final grant um, numbers. So right now we've given them our grant numbers. We've told them what we want to spend in each of these categories. And on September 30, we can say, actually, no, we'd, we'd rather shift a little bit from here to there. The, the bottom line number is still the same. One of the business managers on the last meeting I was on said, well, if I, if I spend more than my allocation, is that okay? Because there's, there's a, a rule that you can switch 10% from one category to another. And, and they're like, no, no, you just can't have 10% more. You, you have to trade it. <laughs> it's a nice try though. Um, so we're gonna do some trading. Um, and then Department of Ed, Remembering that this is federal money, it's actually not even U.S. Ed money, um, not the Education Department of, of the federal government. It's the U.S. Treasury that's giving the states this money. Uh, so there's a, a, a lot of hoops to jump through. Whenever you get federal, federal money, you have to have tons of documentation and tons of good reporting so that they know you're doing a good job with their tax dollars. Um, so that will start. And then um, the thing that's driving us all a little crazy is that all of the funds in this particular grant must be spent and the material must be in hand and in use by December 30. So you can't prepay for a subscription that's gonna go into January. You can only have the part of the subscription that goes to December 30. You can't hire a teacher for the year. You can only pay them well, you can, but then you have to come up with another way to pay them from January to June. Um, so that's been a little bit of heartburn, but that's why we've been focusing on the kinds of things that we have been focusing on, where we can have 
you know, product, services, training, work done in hand and um, accountable by December 30. Is that enough words? All words and no numbers. Did you notice that? <laughs> that was really good. The numbers are in the handout. I do have a question. Yes. When you were talking about the technology and how everybody wants it all at the same time, what would happen if technology wasn't in by 1230? Is there any, do we just have to forego it? Um, I'll answer that by saying that it's supposed to be here in the next two weeks. So we don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, but yeah, I think that we would have trouble with the feds if we said, oh, you know what, the shipment didn't roll in until January 3rd and, and we didn't actually have it in hand. Um, I think that, you know, what I'm hearing is that they're gonna be pretty stringent about, about that requirement, that it needs to be in use. Um, one of the reasons why we didn't go out and buy a bus um, is that it's hard to get a bus built and back in your dooryard by December 30 if you order it late in the year. Um, so there are some things where we've said, well, we could do that, but we're really not confident that we're going to have that product or that, or that service available to us in time. Thank you. Any questions for Kate? All right. I either put you to sleep or... No, this was really good. Knocked it out of the park. This was actually incredible. <laughs> um, Hillary does have a question for you. And Hilly, just you take yourself off mute. Um, I was just wondering, Kate, you said we had spent about, I think you said 1.25 out of 2 million. So uh, do, do those categories that you presented us with, do they all have more money available in them? Like, have you budgeted for more in each of those categories to, to get up to the 2 million? Yes, each of them has a budget that will get us to the two million all told. The only one that's really almost 100% spent is the technology because we've had orders out for so long. Um, and, and because that was the one area that we focused on getting those or orders out early. But we're, we're continuing to purchase sanitation supplies. We're continuing to purchase uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Uh, we're continuing to purchase student supplies and storage supplies and coming up with cool ideas. So um, we have the, the allocation in the budget for each of those sections. And you'll see when you look at the detail that there's a budget for each category. And we have a pretty good sense of where that money is going to go in each category, the remaining money. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Kate, thank you so much. You're welcome. April has a question, Leanne. Oh, sorry, your hand had You just have to wait for me to go. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll, it'll work. Hey. No, that's okay. I couldn't I couldn't get my blue hand up. Um, Kate, do we have money budgeted and I'm sure you've thought about all of this for how to support some of these extra things after December thirtieth, twenty twenty? Like for example, if we have additional buses or not buses, but these these minivans, you know, do we have money budgeted to keep them on the road? Or if we have all of this additional tech, do we have money budgeted to continue to support these pieces after this federal funding is no longer available to us? Yeah, it's definitely a big piece of the question, a big piece of the puzzle. Um, one of the things that we've thought about is, is how to use the money that's in our operating budget that has been um, designated for COVID expenses. Obviously, some of that has already been spent, but some of it we're saying, okay, well, let's, let's use that January to June. Um, there's also a little bit of money, $106,000 from the original CARES Act grant that we got called ESSER um, that also has a mm -hmm. flexible timeline for spending. And as far as um, some of the, the maintenance pieces on these uh, items, you mentioned the, the vehicles. Our vehicle maintenance budget should be robust enough to take care of keeping those vans safely on the road. We have enough money in our fuel budget for that. 
um, and uh, bearing in mind that in some cases running a van is going to be an alternative to running a larger bus. Um, that's not too much of a worry for me. Um, in terms of maintaining the technology, we definitely have some um, concerns about our tech staff. Um, they are definitely out straight right now, and Sandy made reference to that earlier. And we're trying to see whether there's a way that we can wiggle some help for them um, on the personnel side, uh, because they did lose a field tech in our budget process this past year, and then immediately turned around and went into a fully remote environment, and um, things are a little different for them than what they expected this year to look like. So um, that's definitely something we're taking a look at. But again, it would be a, a, a it would be a situation where we would be finding funds from another place that we're not spending them or choosing not to. Um, so I don't have any big worries about um, carrying on in the new year. There's also a, a big fat rumor floating around that we are going to get some more money from the state. I think the worry is what's the timeline for spending it? Because if it has the same December 30 timeline, it's, it's kind of pointless in my opinion. Thank you, Kate. Should I do this? I was gonna say, I'm gonna give it just one more second to see if there's any last questions. I have all night. I think you're safe. Okay, well, I'm right over here. Okay, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Okay, moving into new business, 6.1, motion to accept the meeting minutes of the July 30th, 2020 meeting as presented. So moved. Second. And then, any discussion? You can go straight to the vote. Mrs. Jargon? Yes. Mrs. Giptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. 6.2 are our appointments. 6.2.1 um, are the uh, high school fall coaches. And Mike had discussed this uh, during his workshop. Mm -hmm. So the motion to is to accept the stipend contracts for the 2020 fall season for the high school as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ready to vote? Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. And then the last item tonight, which is 6.3, it's Maine Properties LLC donation. Um, Kate talked about this a little bit during her presentation. Sandy also talked about this. Um, huge thank yous to Main Properties, Rizbara Company. Um, they have donated $25,000 in labor and materials to the Scarborough Public Schools for all six buildings to safely welcome the students back. Um, I am not gonna read the very large press release that goes with this, but I cannot say thank you enough. Um, this is an incredibly generous donation from a great partner in the town. So thank you to uh, Main Properties. And the motion is to accept the $25,000 grant as Given. So moved. Second. And discussion? This is the second donation we've received from them in the last month. Yes. So the last one was like, what, $1,000 a month or something? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for the backpacks. Incredibly appreciative. Yeah. Really appreciative. Okay. I believe we can uh, move to vote. Okay. Ms. Durkin? Yes, with thanks. Mrs. Giptos? Yes, and thank you. Dr. Gill? Yes, and thank you. Ms. Casalonis? Yes, and thank you. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? I think she said yes. You're muted. Mrs. Turner? Yes, thank you. Um, and just for the record, April, if you could pop off mute. Yes, sorry. Thank you. And Mr. Bennett? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, before I go into the last motion of the night, just a reminder that this is the last meeting in Chambers until November. 
Right. Um, they are turning chambers into absentee voting or early voting, however you wish to refer to it. So we will be 100% remote for the month of October. Um, that said, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. Mrs. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Night, guys.